All right, so let's take a look at classroom management. So this PowerPoint is going to take a look at um, some issues that you might encounter, administrative things that you might have to take care of, disciplinary issues. So we're going to look at the instructor's responsibilities, what motivates students to behave in a certain way, and then how to deal with those behavior concerns. So the instructor's responsibility is to manage classroom interactions to establish and maintain a positive, productive learning environment. Sometimes that includes addressing non-productive student behaviors, which is what we're going to look at with managing discipline. So looking at classroom conduct, you should know that all behavior is motivated by something. So understanding and addressing classroom behavior requires an understanding of what that motivation is. And as we dive into that, we're going to take a look at this and see what types of things could drive a person's behavior to act in a certain manner. So motivation is an internal drive to meet an unmet need. So you cannot cause a person to be motivated or give motivation to another person, but you could help students to see how the course relates to their goals, driving their own motivation. So if you have a student who is, you know, disruptive, who is not having the best grades, um, who doesn't seem to be taking the class seriously, no amount of pep talks that you are going to give to them, no amount of yelling at them is going to make them change their, their desire, their motivation. What can help them change that motivation is by you relaying this in a way that you, you remind them why they need this course. Um, so let's use a, a career firefighter for an example. If he is here because he wants a promotion, you know, to a full-time fire department job and they've told him he had to go get his EMT first, drive that back home. Remind him why he's here. You know, it's not for you, but remind him what's going to happen if he can just get it together and make it through this class. So, motivation results from dissatisfaction from the current state of affairs. They want to change things. They want to be better or, in some cases, act up and be worse. So, looking at rewards, students perceive that instructors reward positive behavior or learning and rewards increase persistence and deep learning. And so, these rewards don't have to be physical like monetary or, you know, awards or candy or anything like that. Um, those are a few examples of rewards, but it doesn't have to be that. To reward your students and, and give them more than what they consider busy work, take, an, uh, take a look at what you're assigning them. So assigning meaningful, interesting tasks of appropriate difficulty, not giving them something that's too easy, challenge them. Okay, don't give them something that's too hard and set them up for failure, but meaningful, interesting, interesting tasks, not just busy work, but interesting tasks, but some thought into what you're giving them to do. Give them feedback on strengths and weaknesses, not just a score or a grade. Tell them what they did good. Tell them what they maybe could do better next time. And do not create an atmosphere of competition. So while I like to use a lot of games in the classroom and create a little healthy competition, like with Kahoot and, and you know, team games and things like that, um, you don't want an atmosphere of competition that students are competing against each other for your attention or um, for access to an instructor or equipment or for a grade, per se. You can have a little healthy competition while you're playing games, but not um, for the course as a whole. So before you address student conduct issues, attempt to discover the motivation for the behavior. Why do you think the student is acting this way? Is there something going on at home? Um, do they have some type of underlying uh, issue going on? Are they just having a bad day? And this will help you address it more productively rather than just yelling at them. So some things that we're going to take into consideration are argumentative students, punctuality and attendance, use of electronic devices, student anger, dishonesty, know-it-all students, non-participating students, and sexual harassment. So with hostile or confrontational students, we want to avoid becoming defensive. This escalates the situation. Try to listen to them. Most often they want to be heard. Consider their point of view 
and be honest about whether you can or cannot change something. So if your hands are tied and you know you can't make it an exception to a rule or you cannot change a grade or you cannot give a retake, then let them know that up front. Let them know that you hear them, but that you can't change anything. I'm going to jump back over to this slide. I don't have individual slides for this, but I do want to talk about punctuality and attendance and use of electronic devices. With punctuality and attendance, it's really important that you are on time for class, that you're taking regularly scheduled breaks, that you come back from those breaks on time, um, that you're keeping attendance, that the students feel like they should be there on time, that you're not going to wait and hold up class for them. Um, and usually if it it's a once in a while, you know, traffic, I get it, that type of thing. But if it's all the time that they're coming in late, oftentimes I will put a sign on the door and say, class started at 830, you can wait in the hall until uh, we go on our first break and then you can join the class and they would lose that hour of attendance. And that is what it is. You got to do what you got to do sometimes. With electronic devices, it's really important that you incorporate those in class whenever you can, um, but you don't want them to become a distraction. So with things like Platinum Planner and utilizing those for skills and then also utilizing electronic devices for things like Kahoot and other interactive games, they can be really productive rather than just banning them in the classroom, but making sure that students are utilizing them properly and that they're not becoming a distraction. So moving on to talk about talkative students. So sidebar conversations can have different motivations. They might be discussing something re related to the class or asking questions. So make sure that it's not that. So try to give them the benefit of the doubt and just ask, hey, did you guys have a question? Is there something I can elaborate on for you? If that doesn't work and they continue, if they say, no, no, I don't have a question and they continue to talk as you're lecturing, call everybody to attention. So don't call them out, but just say, hey guys, um, listen up. You know, can I get everybody's attention? You might want to pay attention to this. I like to use keywords like you're going to see this on a test or you might see some test questions that ask about this so that they are really reemphasizing and reiterating that this is really important information. Also, I walk around when I'm talking, um, whenever I'm lecturing to students, so I will just casually walk over to those group of students. Usually just your presence will be enough for them to stop doing what they're doing. They, you know, understand they did something wrong. So just not disrupting everybody else, but just simply walking over into their direction can sometimes be enough. If it's not and it continues, talk with the student on a break outside of class. Don't, you know, embarrass them or disrupt the remainder of the class but talk with them on a break and just see what's going on. With know-it-all students, these may or may not uh, they may or may not be correct in what they're saying. So if they're incorrect, then try to say, um, like, thanks, Jesse. Let's hear what others have to say. Or thanks, Jesse, for your input, but this is how I want the students to perform this task. So don't call on them every time they volunteer. You could direct questions at other students by name, ask the student particularly difficult questions. Again, not trying to embarrass them or set them up for a failure, but just see if they can answer it. Maybe they won't be so um, eager to, to volunteer every time if they find something they're stumped on. Talk to them outside of class if they don't seem to respond to these social cues. Again, they may not understand how to respond to social cues. Some people don't. And then thank the student for their contributions, but explain that you need to hear from all students so that you understand if everyone is progressing on the same level. With non-participating students, there could be a, a variety of reasons why they're not participating. It could be anxiety or lack of confidence. It could be not being prepared for class. It could be because they don't feel challenged or they're bored or a lack of understanding of the material. So um, usually what I try to do if I see a student that's not participating, I will directly call on them and again, not to embarrass them, but if we're running scenarios, I will pick the students and then I'll let them pick their partner. So if I say, okay, it's Jessica's turn to go into the scenario, Jessica, you can pick your partner, then that way that gives them a little bit of freedom and they don't feel so singled out. Um, but it lets them know that I'm watching, I'm expecting you to do something, I'm expecting you to perform. Now, sexual harassment, this is kind of the biggest one. These other ones can be managed in a variety of different ways, but sexual harassment is one that really needs to be addressed the right way. There, there's not a right and wrong way to address some of the other ones, but there is a right way to address this. So with the small community like nature of EMS profession, this makes personal relationships very difficult to avoid. So whether that is 
professional personal relationships with students, whether it is personal relationships with preceptors, sometimes you know these people. And I don't always mean inappropriate personal relationships or dating. I'm just saying um, friendships. You you, And that's difficult. Um, a, a lot of my students, some of you in this class, are some of my closer friends. And so that's very difficult um, to, to kind of separate what's happening in a classroom versus what's happening outside of a classroom. And so um, you kind of have to draw the line when it comes to sexual harassment. So these personal relationships can create a significant ethical dilemma and should be avoided at all costs. So we want to keep notes, first and foremost, keep notes of every interaction, every, no matter how it was, in person, phone calls, text messages, emails, whatever it was, keep records. And then alert your department head or follow the appropriate chain of command. So if this is a student, if it's student on student, if you need to let somebody know an investigation needs to be conducted, if it is a student towards you, um, then again, same thing, an investigation needs to be conducted, report that. Um, so make sure that you're following the appropriate chain there. So that's going to wrap up for classroom management and disciplinary issues. Um, if you guys have any questions about this, please let me know. And I will catch you guys in the last PowerPoint for this week.